Hello, and welcome to Pacific Mammal Research's Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss the interesting facts about each species and debate which one we think is the best. Of course, we think all marine mammals are awesome. This is just our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy this series, and if you want to hear about a particular marine mammal, let us know in the comments. And without further ado, Welcome to the next uh, Marine Mammal Highlights episode of the Pac-Man podcast. Um, this week we're just doing two things. Normally we have three, uh, but this week we're just going to do two and they're, they're uh, related and super cool. So uh, we're going to be talking about, well, I'm, gonna, I'm Cindy and I'm going to be talking about whale poop. And I'm Trevor and I'm going to be talking about whale falls, which is essentially a dead whale sinking to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> so it's kind of a dirty episode. Yeah. <laughs> poop and dead things. Um, but it's really cool. There's some really neat things that um, we're going to look at with these. And basically the way we're looking at it is how these um, whale poop and the dead whales actually help other organisms in the environment. So not just about the whales themselves this time, but how they are benefits to the other animals and the ecosystem overall. I'm going to be talking today about whale poop and how that's important to the environment and to us and to climate change, fighting climate change. So how does whale poop help climate change uh, fight it? Well, it starts with the phytoplankton. So phytoplankton are the little tiny microscopic photosynthesizers that are the base of the marine food web. So they're basically like the little tiny trees in the marine world. Um, and so because they are these little trees and they do that photosynthesis, they take in carbon dioxide, they produce glucose, which is a sugar, which is the food for themselves, as well as the food for the things that eat them. And they release, carbon, uh, they re release oxygen into the atmosphere, which is good for us because we breathe it. So I always was always taught in school when, back in the day when I was in school, so young, um, I was, you know, we always learned about the Amazon rainforest and the trees that are important for producing oxygen. But what's come out more recently um, is that these phytoplankton are super duper important. And I think we've kind of talked about this, like, if you're in the marine world, you kind of know about this, but I think most people have no idea what phytoplankton are in the first place. You can't see it why I believe it, right? <laughs> right, exactly. They're not, they, don't, they don't exist. Yeah. Uh, but, th th but how important they are. So they actually produce 50% of the oxygen in our atmosphere. These tiny little things that you can't even see. Which is just mind-blowing. I mean, you don't, you, know, you don't even think about it. Right. You know, it's like, ah, oh, whatever, this little plankton. Okay, whatever. Super important. <laughs> just a little bit. So those are the really great things about phytoplankton. So how does the whale poop become involved? Well, um, everything needs nutrients. And so these phytoplankton live in these kind of deserty areas a lot of times um, and up in the surface waters where they have to be because of the sun's coming down. They, um, there's not a lot of nutrients there sometimes. And it's really important for these nutrient cycling to happen, right? So taking nutrients from one place and shifting it to another place so that everybody has a chance to get some nutrients. So these, um, we need to get nutrients there somehow. So we have these whales that will, uh, are at the surface, they go down, they dive down to feed, they feed on whatever they're eating, and then they come back up to the surface to breathe and poop, right? Two important parts of life, breathing and pooping. <laughs> so they come up and at the surface, they um, release the nutrients that, were, that they took from where they fed down deeper. So these are, uh, the poop is high in these nutrients like nitrogen and iron and phosphorus, and particularly nitrogen and iron. These are two that are very uh, limiting, right? So this is a limiting nutrient, which means all nutrients are important, but there are certain nutrients that you will run out of first. And once you run out of those, you cannot grow anymore. And that's those nitrogen and iron in, in, the, in the water column. <clears throat> so luckily whale poop is really high in that. Um, and so they bring that up to the phytoplankton 
and they release it and then the phytoplankton can bloom because they're no longer limited by those two nutrients and they are able to just increase in population numbers. So this is similar to something uh, that happens normally uh, in, the, in the water column. Um, so uh, Trevor, why don't you talk about that? Yeah, so upwelling is where nutrients that have maybe originated from lambs, wherever they came from, have sunk to the bottom of the ocean, and then ocean currents, maybe with changes in temperature, basically bring these nutrients along the coast, and as the coast slopes up, so does the water. So the water is bringing up these nutrients along the coast, and that's called upwelling, where these nutrients are suddenly brought up here and then spread out, and then you get all this phytoplankton bloom, which is why, you, honestly, why you see more life in the ocean in general along coasts. Right. Because the ocean, open ocean, is more like a desert versus these nutrients get trapped along the coast, and then it feed the phytoplankton, which is basically the basis of life for the ocean. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So these areas where you get these large swaths of that nutrient coming up. So these, as, as Trevor was saying, a lot of places in the ocean are kind of deserty. So with these whales, you get these little oases of these animals coming up, pooping, and then these big giant phytoplankton blooms, which help all the other animals that are, that live in that area. Well, all of a sudden there's a food supply. Um, so it really creates these nice little pockets in different places for all these different uh, animals. Um, because you, again, you have these phytoplankton blooms and the fish eat those, krill eat those, then fish eat those krill and other, other plankton, um, and then whales and seals and everybody else eats those fish. So it really is a vitally important part of that ecosystem in, in creating uh, food for everybody. And so I think it's kind of funny though that whales will eat the krill, right? We're mainly talking about these baleen whales that eat krill. There are a few um, um, tooth whales that we'll talk about too, but um, mainly these. So they go up, they eat the krill, and then they go down and they, and then, or they go down, they die, they eat the, they eat krill, and they eat up some other fish, um, and then they poop, and then that poop goes to the phytoplankton, which then goes to the krill, which then goes to the whale. So it's like this nice little circle where they're feed, they're, they're fertilizing their own food supply <laughs> and creating. Did you mention that, did you mention that the poop floats at the surface too, which is essential for phytoplankton? Right, that's so the, that's another reason, yeah, when they, when they get to the surface, a lot of other types, like if we pooped in the water, it would sink, which sounds icky to think about, but that's what would happen. Um, but luckily, the, um, the lipid content in whale poop, the fat content, is pretty high. So it actually floats right at the surface or, or just below the surface so that it stays right where all those phytoplankton um, can, can get it, can get at it. In the photosynthetic zone, is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah the, the, photo, photo yeah, the euphotic zone. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, the, why are whales better at this than, than other animals? Well, one thing is that they do come to the surface because the other fish are eating wherever they're at depth and then they poop there. So it's not mixing those nutrients. It's not taking it from down below and bringing it up above. Um, so whales are pooping in shallower water than they feed in, unlike other species. Um, and then because of that fat content, it stays at the surface feeding those phytoplankton. Um, so the whale poop is a really great fertilizer uh, in giving those nitrogen and um, iron to the phytoplankton. Um, and speaking of the whales that can do it the best, right, um, or the, the biggest nutrient movers, um, sperm whales are whales, these are again a toothed whale instead of a baleen whale, but um, they take the prize because they can dive over a mile down. So they're going over a mile down below, eating stuff down there, and then cycling those nutrients back up to the surface where they can be used which is just, it's just crazy to be able to dive a mile down and do anything <laughs> while you're down there. <laughs> you know, all that pressure and all that, yeah. Right, yeah, and it's completely dark, and yeah, it's just nuts. Um, so, <clears throat> so we have these whales going down, coming back up, pooping, it floats, creates all that great food for those phytoplankton. So how does this come back now? Um, and well, so again, those phytoplankton, are that base of the food web. So other zooplankton eat it, other fish, other whales. So they're feeding themselves by creating more food for themselves, but they're also feeding other many other species that are out there. Um, and actually this is something interesting is that the commercial krill fisheries were actually worried that if we increase the whale numbers, that's gonna cut into their, their bottom line, right? It's gonna cut into their catch. But if you look at it, they're actually making more krill happen even though they're taking krill, right? So they're taking quite a bit of krill because they're large whales. Um, but they, that's overridden by how much they, 
will make more be produced by their poop and the, these fertilizing these different parts of the ocean. So whales actually stimulate rather than suppress plankton abundance, which actually is a win for the, the, fil the krill fisheries as well. Like they're krill farmers for themselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're their own, their own krill farmers. Like, let me just put some poop out here to, and the next time I come up, there's going to be lots of krill for me to eat. <laughs> So it's, it's one of those win-wins again, where you look at it and say, oh, if I protect this area from no fishing, that's gonna cut into fisheries because they can't fish there. But when they realize that the fish are safe there and then they reproduce and then they go out of that area, now there's fish for those fisheries to, um, to have. So it's, a, it's, it's one of those where you, when you conserve something, um, the initial like, you're not gonna get as much fish out is overridden by how much you end up getting once they become plentiful. So they make more food <clears throat> for themselves and for the other fish and possibly for fisheries. Um, but how does that relate to, related to climate change? Well, remember I said in the beginning that they're good, that the ocean is a good carbon sink, in particular phytoplankton are. They take in a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, so one thing is if the, car if the phytoplankton take it in and then they don't get eaten, it sinks down to the bottom of the ocean and is left there and until it eventually gets cycled through, but it's staying out of the atmosphere. And even though stuff that they, when they're alive, they're taking that carbon dioxide in and they're turning it into sugars. Um, and then that carbon is going into those sugars, which then go into other animals and the other animal and other animal. But basically it's staying in the ocean. It's not going back out to the atmosphere. That's the, that's the idea. So you're taking carbon dioxide in and not having it be re-released into the atmosphere where it can do the damage that it's doing for our climate change by creating those extra blankets over the planet that keeping it, making it go warmer. So prior to whaling, it was estimated that baleen whales and their poop used to remove millions of tons more carbon than from the atmosphere than they do today, which is amazing. <laughs> like yeah. millions of tons of carbon just because whales existed. Um, and you know we've whaled a lot of these species close to extinction. So the amount of whales that we've reduced is, is huge. And then it's even more huge how much carbon those animals would have been able to sequester. So imagine where we would be now if we hadn't done that. Like maybe we wouldn't be as bad as off as we are in climate change because th that those animals would be taking in that carbon. Had we let nature do what it does, you know? <laughs> right, does what it does better than we do. Like we're like, oh, we're gonna do this and we can fix this and it's better. No, nature, nature's always better <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> So they said that, um, some estimates said that if there was um, an, a 1% increase in phytoplankton productivity due to whale poop, this would capture hundreds of millions of tons of additional carbon dioxide per year. And that is the same as a sudden appearance of 2 billion trees. Which is nuts. Billion trees. Like, and imagine it's how much hard, space hard. 2 billion trees is. It's hard to picture too, just, you know, it's microscopic. You can't, you know, you can't tell what, how much, what amount of phytoplankton is in that acre you know <laughs> right whatever. well yeah like so if you had two billion uh phytoplankton how much space would that take up versus two billion yeah. trees like it's it's hard to know but you would be a lot less <laughs> and like you mentioned earlier the ocean is just a, basically a huge desert so imagine the whole upper ocean you know the whole layer just phytoplankton can you imagine how much carbon that would take in exactly yeah, and, and so that yeah, and they've actually like just thought about like hey what if we dump a whole bunch of iron into these desert patches in the ocean and allow phytoplankton to bloom there. Like what, how would that, you know, maybe that would work and to help sequester carbon. Like that's where we've been looking into things like that. Um, and so instead of doing that, we could just save the whales yeah. and, and the whales could do it. <laughs> Rather than put a bandaid on the problem, fix the problem. Right, and it's a win-win, right? So we're saving whales, they're awesome. And, and it really goes to show how these, these are ecological engineers. So these animals that create um, and are vital in a certain part of the ecosystem or creating that ecosystem in the first place. So the um, keeping these phytoplankton numbers high and creating these little oases around the uh, ocean and these little in the deserts that are out there, um, these whales are vitally important to that. And then if we take that away, it just, it messes everything up. Yeah. Um, so just it goes again, how important these whales are, not just in themselves, but what they do for the ecosystem and how important top predators are as well. Um, that's another thing that, you know, they've looked at where there's certain organisms or species that are more important than others in a given scenario or ecosystem. 
Um, and these would be like keystone species we've talked, we've talked, I think we've talked about in some of our other podcasts. Um, but those ones that are super important and, uh, it just is really important to look at that at an ecosystem level and see, oh, maybe, maybe these whales are doing more than just being cool or more than we, we thought they were doing in the ecosystem, realizing that their poop is, is what is helping a lot of things happen. So whale poop increases phytoplankton productivity and all the benefits that go with it. So this includes, includes increasing population, phytoplankton populations and thus food for other species because um, that's the base of the food web, creates more oxygen, which is great for us because that's what we need, and it combats climate change through removing that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and keeping it from being that extra blanket that we have across the, um, the earth. So by saving the whales, we may help save the planet. Talk about a win-win. <laughs> so if we could just, let's save the whales for themselves, but also for their poop. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, and so next, now we've, now we've talked about the poop, now we'll talk about where, um, what happens to the poop and the animals when they die and how important that is. So whales are just super important whether they're pooping or dying <laughs> or living, all the things together. So oh, Trevor's gonna talk about whale falls next. And so now to end the episode, we are going to talk about death. I was just, <laughs> seems fitting. <laughs> so Trevor's gonna talk about whale falls. Right. So like I mentioned earlier, a whale fall is essentially the death of a whale feeding scavengers on the bottom of the sea. And what I didn't know was a whale fall is only considered a whale fall if it's deeper than a thousand meters. Really? Which I didn't know. Hmm. So if it's shallow, it's not a whale fall? Technically no, because it scavenged so much quicker. Oh, because oh, right, you want the whole, oh. basically the, most of the whale to sink and be down there versus being right. eaten by the way down. No, that makes sense. Say like a whale dies out and just the sound here, you're only at like 500 feet maybe at the max. Right. And then you have all sorts of organisms, but the deeper you go, the less organisms you get, essentially. So it's specifically so, the, interesting. Deep, the deep ones. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I did, I, I guess it kind of makes sense, but I didn't think about that. I didn't either. Very but. Cool. What was also surprising to me was the first official like whale fall was discovered in the 70s when they started classifying them as whale falls. So they had mm -hmm. like ideas before that, like, ah, this is weird. But they started recognizing it as an essential ecosystem function in the 70s. And now they've started to get more and more research on it. And they've actually discovered new species deep in the ocean, specifically at these whale fall sites. Yeah, and that's the crazy thing that I that when I've heard about that is that they only like they only exist on whale falls, so it's kind of like right. the barnacles. Like, how do you end up finding the species? You know, the species that you're going to attach to. How do you end up finding a whale fall, which happens very happenstance? Yeah, and that's right. the only place you live. I'll talk about that a little bit more too as we go, but because there's some cool research about that. But essentially, what happens is. Most of the whale falls they research are in the Pacific Ocean, like due to the migration routes of whales. Yeah, makes sense. Like humpback goes from Hawaii to Alaska, for example, dies and sinks. So these whale falls are considered oases, really, because the bottom of the ocean, like thousands of feet deep, are just a desert. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, with all these scavengers like crabs and small fish and other organisms, you get this thousands of pounds of meat, essentially, <laughs> all of a sudden just falls. It's and like, you get all sorts of fish. Like, have you heard of hagfish? I think some of us oh, have. Yeah. yeah, they're the, like yeah, the number one thing. They're, like the most primal fish there is. But so it's the jo they're jawless, right? The yeah, jawless, the jawless fish. fish. Yeah, it's just like they're basically a tube. Yeah. So they're they're just going all over it, and all sorts of like crabs. Like basically anything that eats meat, it's kind of like in stages. They come in, mm -hmm. and that might last for up to a year and a half of just eating the the, the organic material, and you get big organisms like sleeper sharks. I'm not sure if you've heard of sleeper oh, sharks. I've heard of them, cool. yeah. They're like 20 feet long, I think they can get, which are really slow moving sharks down, way down deep. And then you get like giant isopods, all sorts of cool organisms. So what happens is that lasts for usually months on end, just eating the organic material. And then you get other colonizers that might come in, such as these bone boring worms, which are really cool. Oh yeah, I've heard about those. Those are crazy. Yeah, so there's a starting to research these. I think there's, I think they've identified 30 species of these worms now, and some of them are whale specific, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool. Like some of these worms only go on gray whales, and some of these might only go on humpbacks, which is kind of cool. Oh, 
So the, they're even picky about the dead animal that they eat. Yeah, it might just be like <laughs> different feeding capabilities because what happens with these worms, they don't actually have a stomach, which is wild. They're symbiotic okay. with bacteria. So what they do is these worms find the bones after all the organic material has been harvested mm -hmm. and they secrete an acid that dissolves the bone, <laughs> allows them to bore into it. Oh, and then they just absorb it? And then the bacteria that they have that they're symbiotic with mm -hmm. basically dissolves the lipids and then they produce sugars for the worm that they absorb. Interesting. Well, it's, it's almost... Crazy. Yeah, it's almost like the um, like termites and stuff that can't actually eat wood, but the bacteria and stuff they have in their gut is what actually allows them to digest that stuff. Right. So that symbiotic relationship is the reason why they can do it. Very cool. So the research I was looking at, that's like considered stage two once these start arriving. Mm -hmm. And stage three, some people call it the sulfuric stage or sulfophilic stage. <laughs> and Sulfa that is, right. <laughs> when, uh, when the bones decompose, Sulfur is produced by the bacteria, which, uh, like bivalves and clams and such, they use that sulfur to live. And then they start colonizing these bones and go after the sulfuric bacterial film and they're required for their survival. So it's hypothesized that as these colonizers come in on the bones, some even call that the reef stage as these permanent animals start building on it. It's possibly hypothesized that whale falls helped introduce these animals that depend on sulfur to hydrothermal vents, which is... Wait, what? It's you a connect, hypothesis, but... You just connected whale falls to hydrothermal vents? Right. They call it an evolutionary stepping stone. Interesting. So they hypothesize either whale falls help these organisms spread geographically. Oh, so okay. So you have a hydrothermal vent, you spawn. You find a whale, you find a whale, you find a whale. Oh, no. <laughs> it's like lily pads. <laughs> right. Or with the sulfur being produced, they think, oh, sweet. And then they eventually find themselves to a hydrothermal vent, like, oh, this is constant sulfur. And then it's just adaptive radiation is what they call it. And then they just totally depend on sulfur from that there point. Which is really cool. Uh, so this, these whale falls have both helped organisms that basically depend on them on the bottom of the ocean while also allowing organisms to potentially evolve to specific environments. I think that's pretty cool. That's nuts. That is really crazy. I mean, I, I did not see you going from whale falls to hydrothermal vents. <laughs> that's so yeah, neat. Did I want to it. It's just nuts. That's really cool. But yeah, I mean, Obviously, the scavenging is a big factor, but then you start looking at the nitty gritty of smaller organisms that you've never even thought of, which are essentially these whale falls are essential for their survival as well. Yeah, and I mean, it's just crazy because, again, like, how do you find, like, they just happen. <laughs> and then down deep, you're able to, these animals are able to find these crazy, like, like you said, it's almost like a mirage, right? <laughs> it's real. It's a giant whale. And we didn't really, I mean, it's this, all this research is starting to gain more traction now because we didn't discover it until the 70s. Right. And now like, we get more and more advanced, basically deep diving submersibles. Well, and that's the thing. It's the technology that allows us to even know that this exists. Right. When you go thousands of feet underwater, you can actually see it. They use sonar to help find these whale falls because it's just basically barren waste of the end of the whale fall. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> nothing, 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 nothing. <laughs> yeah. They'll go sink a whale and then they'll monitor it. Yeah, I've heard them do that uh, recently a couple times where they, it, and sinking a whale is difficult, but um, being able to do that uh, and then know that that's what, and then they would go back and check it and, you know, send it out every couple years and that's where they'd find all these new animals that they never knew existed. Some of those researchers have like a, bit, a camera base there for maybe a week or something like that just to get all sorts of data and see what's mm -hmm. there eating and there's, so, you know, what have we only discovered 1% of the ocean floor or something like that. Right, we know more about the moon than we know about the ocean floor, yeah. so. So we're finding more species with these whale falls, depending on them, what else, you know? <laughs> right. Well, I find it interesting, too, that there is certain certain species that only go for certain whale species. Like, you would think that, yeah. you know, any whale is dead. Yay! <laughs> Which, that also might just be a regional thing, too, with the migration. Mm -hmm. So it's not confirmed, but it's hypothesized. That's true. Interesting. Wow. 
that, that's one of the if you if you can find if you actually just google like put do what you know whale falls you can find some of the video for um that they have of these and they're it's just super creepy with all the crazy looking animals that they are sitting there devouring that that carcass and they can last for 100 years because bones take forever to decompose that's true so that's why they've considered it a reef stage sometimes when they find all these clams and mussels on the bones that makes sense yeah because yeah the, that's going to be around for a while just like it would be. So, so it's almost like an, a temporary artificial reef <laughs> right <laughs> temporary yeah. for a fair amount of time and those bivalves you know, they need hard substrate versus just a muddy bottom when you right. get a bone that's something you can latch onto right wow that's crazy super cool very cool so that uh ends our our that we have anything else for whale falls right that was it Nope, that's it. Got it. Super cool. Um, so that's our episode for this uh, episode of Marine Mammal Highlights. And we'll be back next week, probably with a paper review. Um, but we will uh, see you then. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P-A-C-M-A-M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks.